this out for this film? Probably not. No. As long as yeah, as long as the misspelling is uh, doesn't actually make it into something else. Like oh I, I just misspelled nitrate with an I, so it looked like nitrate, but I meant nitrate. You know I'm not gonna take that. Actually a good way to look a good way to learn these, um, which I can I can actually say is the way that I learned the elements in the periodic table, is a placemat. Put, and you don't have to buy a periodic table placemat, but get a clear placemat and put your, seriously, put a copy of the periodic table under your placemat. Then when you go to sit and eat every meal at home, you'll be staring at the periodic table. And you, <laughs> and you will learn some things, because I don't know, it just works, so try it. You should also study, by the way, that's not like a replacement, but uh, I found that to be helpful. Okay, let's try some other problems from last week to kind of remind ourselves how these sorts of things work. So I want you to calculate how many moles are in 5.00 grams of this molecule, which is called what? Careful. Sodium hydride. Sodium hydride. That's just as hydrogen. That's not an OH is hydroxide. OH is hydroxide. If it's just an H, it's hydride. So how many moles are in 5 grams of sodium hydride? If you don't have a calculator handy, um, and you don't have one on one of, on like these the magical portable telephones, um, then just set it up and don't worry about the actual calculation. So how do you set this up? Yeah. Okay. So. Let's set up our conversion. We're going to do, do this just like any of the other unit conversions that we did. We want to get rid of grams and end up with moles. So we're going to have grams down here and moles up here. OK? So now we need to know how many grams per mole. And how do we figure that out? From the periodic table. Um, we add up the masses that are underneath the elements, and we say, okay, you know, we can, I don't, we, we've got about three significant figures to deal with here. So we've got uh, 23.0 for sodium and 1.01 for hydrogen. So that's going to be, uh, I'll just say 24.0 grams sodium hydride per one mole of sodium hydride. And you do that, comes out to about 0.2-ish, right? What? 0 0.208. 0 All right. So about a fifth of a mole. Good. Questions about that? Okay, I'm going to ask you to extend this a little bit now. How many moles of sodium ions in these this above quantity? How many moles of just sodium ions are in that many moles of the sodium hydride compound? So to figure this out, think about what it means. Think about what moles mean. Imagine you had a mole of it, or imagine a dozen if that's a better number for you to imagine. And then think about how many moles of sodium you would have in that. It's not really a, a big calculation to do here, but it's 
both the small one. So what do you think? You multiply by 20, Why? Because 23 is the, is the most of the sodium and 24 is the whole. Um, okay, we'll talk about that in a minute, I'm, but I'm actually, you'd be correct if we we're talking about mass, how much, or, or like a mass percent, but I'm actually asking something more uh, simpler here. Just how many moles of sodium are in this many moles, so there's not a unit conversion that needs to be done here. Any ideas? Well, that would give you the number of uh, specific individual ions. But I just want the number of moles. Why 0.199? I achieved, but they said 0.208 moles equals the addition of those 2.3.9. So how many moles are we looking for when you equal 22.9, which is the sodium ions? Okay, well, that's interesting. But I was, again, asking in this particular compound. So it's actually still simpler than that. Yeah. It's just the same thing. It's just the same thing. It's just the same thing. It didn't feel right this time? Let's talk about why. Um, I think this becomes difficult because we think of moles as this sort of abstract chemical concept that requires a lot of calculations. But really what it is is just a number. So imagine you had. Um, Let's say, I don't know, what's something that's connected together? Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Okay, let's say, no, that's, that's not a, okay, let's, let's do it this way. Yeah, you got a dozen eggs, okay? Um, has everybody seen uh, an egg? You know what an egg looks like? <laughs> I don't want to assume. <laughs> so you got a dozen eggs. And an egg is made up of a white and a yolk, right? I mean, to be a little reductive, but there's a white and a yolk. So if you have a dozen eggs, how many yolks do you have? A dozen. Same thing, right? You got a dozen sodium hydrides. They're made up of a sodium and a hydride. So you must also have a dozen sodiums and a dozen hydrides. All right? Okay. Thanks. All right. Let's try one that's that's similar, um, with a with a little bit of a twist. So now I'm going to to ask you a similar question. I'm not going to write it out as explicitly. I'll just say how many moles are in five grams of potassium sulfate. How many moles of potassium sulfate and five grams of potassium sulfate? And then, I ask you for the moles of potassium. All right, so let's set up the calculation the same way. Five grams um, What's the molar mass or the molecular weight of potassium sulfate? 174 grams. So if you do that calculation, what do you get? What? 029? Can you get one more significant figure in there? No, we need one more. 287? Or, another way we could write that, since it's getting a little small, 
we could say 28.7 millimoles or 2.87 times 10 to the uh, minus 2 moles. Okay, so now let's talk about these questions again. How many moles of potassium are in them, are in there? Are you sure? How many moles of potassium are in that much potassium sulfate? What is that? That's a trick question. I didn't say it was a trick. It's not a trick. What? Is it the same? Well, let's think about it. Think about one molecule of potassium sulfate. It's like one egg. How many potassium ions are in that one molecule? Two. Okay. So a mole is just another number. It's like one. So if there's two in one molecule, then there's got to be double in however many of, of molecules. So the moles of potassium, if we want to set that up like a whole equation, we would say 28.7 millimoles times um, 2 millimoles of potassium per one millimole of potassium sulfate. And so that's going to be double. It's going to be 57.4. Okay. So sort of like saying, if you had a mole of people, well, okay, if you had a dozen people, how many arms would you have? Two dozen, because each person has two arms. So same thing. You got a mole of potassium sulfate, then you must have two moles of potassium, because there's two. All right, what about sulfate? Same as what? Yeah, so sulfate, there's only one sulfate ion per potassium sulfate molecule, although it's an ionic compound, it's not really a molecule. Um, so that means that we have 28.7 millimoles overall in there. Okay. We're going to go through this a little bit more formally today when we talk about empirical formulas and things like this, but, um, but I, think, I think you get this. I think you get the idea. Am I right in thinking that? Or, uh, maybe? Okay. Okay. Yes. So sulfate is SO4 2 minus. What if you ask how many moles of oxygen? If I asked how many moles of oxygen ions, what would you say? Or oxygen atoms? Times four. Times four. Yeah, you have to have this number times four. Okay. And what if I asked you, all right, let's do this. How many potassium ions? So not how many moles of potassium ions, but how many actual ions? How would you figure that out? Right. So the total number of ions, we have to multiply by how many are in a mole. So that would be 0 0.0287 moles times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd ions per one mole. That's a big number. I want to punch that out. Wait, that's not right. What's wrong here? 
What? Yeah, you have to multiply that whole thing by two. So we shouldn't have used that number. We should have used the actual number of moles of those ions, which is 0 0.0574. And then we get, oh, OK, so that was actually the right answer. Anybody else? OK. All right, we'll try these again, uh, some more of this a little bit later. But make sure you can do these types of calculations for the quiz next week as well. All right. OK. Let's talk about percent composition. So we'll do, we'll do a little bit of this. Um, we'll take a little break, and then we'll come back, talk about the lab, and then finish up whatever time we've got left. OK, two ways of describing the composition of a compound. Fairly straightforward. You can have the numbers of constituent atoms, meaning what we kind of just talked about. If you had something like H2O, you could describe it as made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Okay? Really straightforward. And the other time the other way that you can describe it that we haven't really talked about much is in terms of the percentage by mass of its element. So that's like saying that water has x percent hydrogen by mass and y percent oxygen by mass. And those things are going to be very different ways of describing it, and they're going to have different uses. Okay. Um, for instance, before atomic theory, there was no number one there. All compounds were described in terms of mass percentage of elements. Uh, often when we make empirical observations of composition, that is when we directly measure how much of something is in something, we're using number two. And so what we're going to focus on now is figuring out, first of all, what that means and how to convert between them. So we, no matter which one we have, we can get the other one if that's what we need for our intended purpose. All right, so let's talk about mass percentage. I want you to calculate the percent by mass of hydrogen and oxygen in water. How would you do that? Any ideas? Well, you calculate them. the more mass using. Uh, like H is 1 and uh, O is uh, 16. OK, so let's start there. Yep, so hydrogen is 1. We'll just use simple numbers. 1 gram per mole and oxygen is 16 grams per mole. And then water would be 18 grams per mole. So if, for instance, you take the 16, you divide it by 18. Mm -hmm. And you multiply by 100, you get the percentage. Yep, great, thank you. So the percent by mass of oxygen is going to be 16, the number of, of grams of oxygen in the 18, 16 grams of oxygen, divided by 18 grams per mole of water. Okay. And I guess technically, since we're doing, looking at a percentage, we're going to then multiply that by 100%. And you get about. Eighty-nine percent by mass for oxygen. So percent by hydrogen, you can do it the same way. One gram per mole divided by eighteen grams per mole times a hundred percent. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, two because there's two of them. Thank you. And that's going to give us eleven percent. 
Now you didn't have to do that calculation because they all have to add up to 100%, right? So the last one always is easy because it's just whatever's left over. All right, as a little bit of practice, uh, let's just look at, I'm not going to make you calculate all of these right now. Let's look at the percent of oxygen in each of these compounds. So see if you can calculate the percent by mass of oxygen in each of these compounds. All right, what'd you come up with for, for the first one here? Let's, let's look at the um, math. So you would do, there are four oxygen atoms times 16 grams per mole per oxygen. And the overall molecular weight is, can I write that down? 233? Maybe. Wait, did you calculate it or you just guessed? I, I, I Can anybody confirm that number? Okay, all right, good. I remember it was like 27.5%. And so what do you get if you put those together? 27.5%. Oh, sorry, 27.5%. Is that what I got? Yeah. All right, methanol, we're going to have one oxygen atom. And the overall mass is? So I can do that math. 50%. And then in caffeine, we've got two oxygens. So that'll be 2 times 16. What's the overall mass here? Wait, I got 146, 194. One ninety four, all right. And you get about sixteen and a half percent. Okay. And there's an easy way to check this. If you're ever doing these problems. All right. Rather than just using subtraction to get the last one, calculate them all out. And if they don't add up to one hundred, one of your calculations is wrong. All right, you seem to be uh, OK on that front. I'll let you do this one at home. Um, you're going to calculate the mass percent composition of nitrogen in each nitrogen-containing compound. Now, these would be how these compounds would be described um, in many situations. Uh, the, the fact that one is more nitrogen-rich than another, more oxygen-rich than another, actually would dictate what's different about them. And people would describe them that way. And we, and we still do in many situations. But let's talk about what happens when you go the other way. When you can get mass percent, because you can do experiments to get mass percent, and then you have to figure out the formula. That's when it gets a little bit tricky. Um, and so you can do this by something called elemental analysis. Uh, we actually have one of these um, in the other room now. We just got it this summer. It's called inductively coupled plasma. And it is a, a plasma torch that uh, basically excites all atoms at super high energy and you can determine how much of each atom is in there. Um, you can do that to figure out the amount of each element in the compound, but it won't tell you anything about the atoms. It'll only tell you about the amounts. So what we need to do is look at this ana elemental analysis, look at those relative amounts, and we're going to figure out how to get those relative amounts into the mass percent, and then in from the mass percent into the uh, formula. So to do that, we needed to find two things quickly. The empirical formula and the molecular formula. What you get from the mass percent is the empirical formula. In other words, you've, you may have heard these terms before. Empirical formula is the smallest whole number ratio example of the elements. So ethane is C2H6, but its empirical formula is CH3, because you can divide 2 and 6 by 2 and get 1 and 3. Okay. 
The reason this is important is that empirical formulas and molecular formulas have the same mass percents. So the experimental data associated with these are the same. Um, what we have to figure out is the mo or, or how we figure one from the other is the molar mass. So rather than belabor, belabor these definitions, let's look at glucose. So you, we've, done this, we've done some calculations, we've done some measurements on glucose, and we found out it has an empirical formula of CH2O. Its molecular mass is 180.16 grams per mole. So what is its molecular formula? In other words, all we know is the ratio is one carbon to two oxygens to one, or to two hydrogens to one oxygen. How do we know actually how many carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens are in there? What do you think? What? Yes. So how do we get to the molecular formula from that? Yeah, divide by the total, right? Let's do that. CH2, O, whoops, the molecular weight of CH2O is, what, 30, right? Right? If you add that up, somebody can, yeah. Okay. Gets late, uh, my math stuff gets a little fuzzy. So if CH2O is 30, how many CH2Os are going to be in 180? Because the overall molecular mass is 180. It's about 6, right? That means that the overall molecular formula must be CH2O, and there's 6 of them. Or another way of describing that would be c 6 H12O6. So what we did was we took the 180 and we divided it by 60, whoops, 30, and got 6, or about 6. So that told us that the molecular formula must be 6 times the empirical formula. We multiply everything by 6 and we get this as the molecular formula. And that is indeed how many of each atom are in one molecule of glucose. So you need to know a couple things to get the formula. You need to know the mass percents or the, the, to get you the empirical formula. We'll talk about how to do that in a second. And you need the molar mass or molecular weight so you know the overall formula. If you don't have those, um, then you probably can't do it. Right? If you didn't know the molecular mass of glucose, you wouldn't know that this was six times that. So you need to be given that information. So now, let's take the next step back. We, figure, we know how to do the molecular formula from the empirical formula. So now let's look at how to get the empirical formula from the mass percent. And here's kind of a, a stepwise set of instructions from your book. We're going to go through some examples so you get a feel for what this, what this means. So you're going to take 100 grams of compound, and the percent will represent a, a mass in grams of that element. You figure out the number of moles, divide each value in the number of moles uh, of the smallest one, and then multiply each number by an integer so that they're all whole numbers. That's probably confusing and makes no sense. So that's how we're going to work through as an example. OK. So here's, do I have it down here? Here's your example. The elemental mass percent composition of ibuprofen which is a pain relief drug, is 75.69% C, whatever, whatever. Okay, you can read those. Determine the empirical formula. So from just those three numbers, you can figure out the empirical formula of ibuprofen. All right? And here's how you do it. You assume 100 grams. That's step one. Don't worry about this bottom one for now. Let's go back to step one. So step one, assume 100 grams. Why can we do that? Because this isn't a quantity problem. We can have as much as we want. So let's assume 100 grams. This is always going to be your first step. OK. 
If I have 100 grams, how many grams of carbon do I have? 75.69, right? That's why we assume 100. It makes all the numbers nice and easy. So that means Seventy five point six nine grams of carbon, eight point eight zero grams of hydrogen, and fifteen point five one grams of oxygen. All right. So now We need to go to number two. Determine the number of moles of each element in 100 grams using the atomic masses of the elements, the masses that we know or we can look up. So for each of these masses now, we're going to determine how many moles that is, which is what we just practiced earlier. So 75.6, all right, so let's, let's number this. This is step one. This is step two. 75.69 grams of carbon times one mole of carbon for 12 grams of carbon equals 6.31 moles of carbon. And we do the same thing for the other elements. 8.80 grams of hydrogen times one mole of hydrogen. I know I'm sort of laboring this writing it out, but this way we have you know, a nice template to follow for the next time. Gives us 8.08 .08 moles of hydrogen. Oh, yep, sorry. And then 15.51 grams of oxygen times 16 grams per mole is going to give us 0 0.97 moles of oxygen. OK, so now we know how many moles of each of these there are in 100 grams which doesn't necessarily seem to lead us closer to the answer to the question, which is the empirical formula. But actually, now we are really close. How do we figure out the empirical formula from this? Do you know? What? Um, actually, you don't. you don't. You can go directly from these numbers. You could do it that way. Um, but you'll end up doing the same thing in the next step then, also. Um, you don't round yet, actually. What we need to do is find a ratio. Remember, the empirical formula is a ratio of atom to atom to atom. So it's like how much carbon to how much hydrogen to how much oxygen. And we now have numbers that tell us that based on moles. So what we need to do is this step three, which is divide everything by the smallest number. All right? Divide each value by the smallest of the values calculated. That'll normalize everything to 1. Or not, that's not really the right word. It'll give us a base of 1. So the smallest number here is 0.97, right? So then in step 4, or step 3, sorry, we take we divide everything by the smallest. And let's do that. So 6.31 divided by 0 0.97. I've got these numbers, so I'll just write them down as 6.5. Um, 
8.80 divided by 0 0.97 is 9.07. And 0 0.97 divided by 0 0.97 is, of course, 1. So now we've set everything in a ratio with one at the bottom. And we can say that there's about one, one oxygen to nine hydrogens to six and a half carbons. So this is carbon, this is hydrogen, and this is oxygen. And then we go to the final step to figure out the actual formula. If the numbers are not whole numbers, multiply each number by an integer so that the results are all whole numbers. You can round them if they're pretty close. So let's go back and look at those. So 6.5, we can't really round, because that's right in the middle, right? 9.07, I think we can round that. So we're going to, what are we going to multiply everything by in the fourth step to make it all nice? Four. Can you see that green color, by the way, if I do green? Or is that too light? What? Okay. Yeah. So we're going to multiply everything by 2, and we end up with 12.5. And, and that's the empirical formula. Okay. So now, going back and looking at this molecule, is that also the molecular formula? Here's the structure of ibuprofen. Yeah. Oh. That's not a general step, but what we, what we need to do is get that 6.5 to be a whole number because you can't have six and a half, you can't have a half of a carbon atom in an empirical formula. So we're going to multiply two by two to get all whole numbers. Or at least close. Or close to whole, whole numbers, yeah. So if you got six, if you got something that was a 0.33, you would probably multiply everything by three get all whole numbers. If you got a, you know, 0.8, you would multiply by whatever, you know, you needed to do that. So that would get big. But generally, you'll it, generally it'll be like a 0.5 or maybe a 0.3 and you just multiply by 2 or 3 and you've got it. Okay. So you, you ready to try one of these on your own? Well, you're always multiplying by integers. So so it can't mess, you know, if, if everything else is already integers, it won't. You may encounter something where you have two of them that aren't, and then you have to find a number that multiplies both of them big enough to actually, yeah. So. All right. Let's try one. Okay. Give that one a try. The question was, do you have to convert it to steps, or to percent? If you go back up and check those steps, remember what we did in the first step was we converted to grams. So if we already have grams, we can skip that and start here at step two. All right, so what was your first step here? To convert it to moles. Uh, I won't go through the whole calculation, but how many moles did you come up with? How, many, how much of nitrogen? One point, so that turned into 1.75 moles of nitrogen and 4.38 moles of oxygen. OK, great. So then what did you do? Divide it. What did you divide each by? So let's label these if you're going around later. So that was step two.
Step three, we'll divide each by 1.75. So 1.75 divided by 1.75 is obviously one. And 4.38 divided by 1.75 is 2.5. Okay. So then that means that you figured out it's uh, N O 2.5, right? And since, or N1 O 2.5, and since we know you don't have fractional, we're going to multiply it by 2 and end up with N2 O 5. Yeah. Yeah, good question. I, I mean, realistically, I would say anything within 0 0.1 is good. If it gets too far out of 0 0.1, that may not be right. But a lot of that is going to depend on, I mean, if you're given problems like that, you're not going to encounter that because they're nice numbers that you're given, right? It, a lot of it depends on your... Um, instrument accuracy and your lab techniques and the cleanliness of the sample if it's contaminated or not so in real life there's going to be lots of factors that that dictate that um, but generally if you're within point one which is what problems will generally be you can certainly round yeah yeah it should be fairly clear, you know? Like, it should be close. If it's, like, if it's a third, it should be pretty close to 0.33. And you need to know, you know, you need to multiply by 3 or something like that. Um, or 0.667, or, you know? It should be pretty close to one of those types of numbers, like those fractions that we know are fractions. Um, if you get something really weird, like a 0.21 or something, you might want to recheck your numbers. Or you might just want to see if it's reasonable that you would need to multiply by 5. Sometimes that could happen, sure. All right, um, it is 6.30. Let's take a little break, and we'll come back and talk about combustion analysis and lab and chemical formula or chemical equations. So take about uh, 15 minutes or so.